Gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, today I'm going to be showing you how I substantially improved the efficiency of this here diesel heater. Now, for those of you who don't know, there are generally two methods of providing heat on the go. Uh, that being propane and diesel. Propane has some advantages. You'll see these, you know, Mr. Buddy heaters most of the time where, well, for one, it doesn't need electricity. It's portable. And that's about it. Uh, the problems with propane are often the products of combustion will be vented directly into the space so that if you don't crack that window open, that carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and water vapor will accumulate and you could get a headache or worse, uh, as well as frost and, and condensation problems. As well, they're not super automatic. So if you set a certain output on your heater and it gets colder in the middle of the night, well, you might wake up and find that, well, what happened? Now it's cold in here. Diesel solves a lot of those problems. So this diesel heater, for example, is super popular. You'll see it installed in RVs, houseboats, stuff like that. And there's a lot of great things about it. Number one, it's diesel. So if you have a diesel RV, plumb it directly into the gas tank. Now you don't, well, fuel tank. And now you don't have to worry about, well, now I also have to pick up propane in addition to the diesel for my RV. So that's a problem that it solves. Uh, it's also indirect fired. So that means that all the combustion products are vented outside and not, you know, into your living space, which is great. They're automatic, they're electric. So they have thermostats on them where if you set a temperature, it will maintain that temperature, period. So that's fantastic. And one last thing of note is, I believe they have like five liter fuel tanks. So they'll run overnight off of a car battery and five liters of fuel, no problem, no problem. Unlike those, you know, one pound propane cylinders. Now, of course, the reason why I wanted a diesel heater was, well, winter camping. Um, sleeping in minus 20, while it's possible with the right gear, it's not fun. I find that my face gets cold because, of course, that's the one part of your body you can't hide in a, in a sleeping bag is your face. Um, so I found that warming that tent up to even minus 5 or 0 degrees is actually really nice. It makes a huge difference. But, of course, when you're in the boonies, you don't have electricity. So you can't use an electric space heater. You need something that'll run off of a fuel. So that's where this comes in. Now, the problem with that for that application is that the exhaust on this thing can come out at like 300 degrees Celsius. And that's why you'll see them installed in RVs more often and not in people's tents, because you have to use this stainless steel exhaust pipe, which is not super portable. So I've come up with a contraption that solves all of those issues and that it improves the efficiency of the heater. Yes, it absolutely does by cooling that exhaust off and recovering heat from it, but it also lowers the temperature of the exhaust enough to where you can use sort of like a flexible, portable exhaust tube instead of that stainless steel stuff. Here's the basic principle of operation. The hot exhaust comes out, goes down here, runs through this heat exchanger, gets cooled down, comes out. This heat exchanger, we have the water coming in on this side. Again, very important because it's cross flow heat exchange that we want, not parallel flow, because we have this coldest water matched up with the coldest exhaust and the hottest water matched up with the uh, hottest exhaust. Therefore, we get that most efficient heat exchange, whereas if it was parallel, there's limits to how much you can heat that water and cool that exhaust. Uh, anyways, after we have the water coming out here, it's hot. It runs up to the radiator we have up top. Another beautiful thing, this thing just sits here. It doesn't have an extra fan. It, the air gets sucked through here by the existing fan on the existing heater. We don't really have an extra active component there. So this just preheats the air going into the heater, which means we get hotter air coming out, therefore improving the efficiency. Anyways, we get cooled water coming out and it enters into this reservoir and the reservoir feeds this pump, which runs the water through the whole system. Now, of course, the beauty of the system primarily is that, as you can see, everything's attached to the actual physical unit. I can still pick this thing up and go. You know, I don't have really anything extra. 
and it only has one additional active component, which is just a tiny little pump. So this thing's probably not going to fail anytime soon, and it really doesn't use that much power either. And the only thing that's actually exposed to that nasty corrosive diesel exhaust is this copper. And copper is fairly corrosion resistant, so I would expect this to hold up a fairly long time. Now, in addition to the fact that it's all physically on the unit, we have some other major advantages. Uh, for starters, because we're using room air to cool off the fluid, this fluid will never get below freezing, or at least we're not expecting it to during operation, which means that there is no possibility of us freezing any of the condensate in this exhaust tube, which means it's not going to plug up. Another thing to consider is this thing, I'll show you the photo of this. You can look at this whole assembly right now. Uh, just to briefly explain it, um, we have the stainless steel exhaust tube glued onto here with RTV silicone that just sort of forms an adapter to the copper pipe. And this is all brazed because of course, high temperature, solder would melt. But if I'm being honest, I could have used silicone to glue these fittings together as well. I just didn't. And this is soldered because, well, you can use solder because it doesn't get that hot. Uh, but in any case, a big advantage of this as well is it actually has a built-in muffler. So this jacket's on here because obviously you don't want this hot exhaust tube either burning you or melting whatever you put it on top of. So that of course keeps, keeps that from happening. But also because it's fiberglass uh, covered with silicone, um, it actually has sound absorbing quality. So when I have the section with all these holes drilled in it, all this turbulent loud exhaust bounces around in here and all the sound or a lot of the sound gets absorbed by that fiberglass insulation. Incidentally, fiberglass is the exact same thing inside the muffler and now I don't need a separate muffler. So that's another component that is built into the unit and not physically separate. So that helps the portability even more. So we actually have a really elegant solution here because all we've added is that can fail really is the pump and everything's physically attached to the unit and we get the bonus of having higher efficiency, cold exhaust that you can run through plastic piping if you want, and a built-in muffler. So we've taken a whole bunch of, of components that would need to be physically separate from the unit and we've built it right in. And this is about as simple as I think you could make it. Enough of that, let's go get some hard data on how this thing actually performs. All right, so we've got our testing apparatus set up. I'm just going to start this on the lowest power level. Of course, it'll run that fan. Uh, one of the first things I'm gonna do is put this into something called Alpine mode by pressing these two buttons here at the same time. And that little mountain symbol enables, and you can actually hear the fuel pump audibly slow down. You can hear it. Of course, one of the things that's going to do is to uh, lean out that air fuel ratio, hopefully reducing the problem that I was having earlier, i.e. soot buildup. Um, and soot buildup is of course because there's too much fuel, not enough air, so it's not getting fully burnt. And one of the potential causes of that might be the increased resistance of my exhaust manifold here. Possibly. No guarantees, but it's possible. But in any case, Alpine mode should fix that. Now, of course, I have my lab bench power supply. I also have this supplemental power supply, and that's because that glow plug in this unit consumes quite a lot of power, more than this can provide. Uh, so I'm going to be using this for testing, but this is just here to get it started. All right, so we're running on power level one. It's kind of stabilized a little bit. Um, I've given it a few minutes to kind of settle in, so we're going to start taking some measurements. Uh, so for starters here, it's kind of hard to tell because the fuel pump consumes power and pulses, but I'd say mm, probably consuming about 14 watts. Inlet temperature on the back. If I measure the outlet temperature in the center of this tube here, 59.9. I'll measure the center of the exhaust on the back, 55.9. Take the speed one inch from the outlet here, 3.6 meters per second, 48 decibels. 
Now if we look closely at the back, you can actually see that we're getting water dripping out of the heat exchanger. And that's good because that means that we're getting condensation. For those of you who don't know, um, a fuel such as kerosene is going to have two heating values. Uh, there's a lower heating value and there's a higher heating value. Now the lower heating value is what you get just by burning it and extracting the sensible, i.e. just temperature energy. The higher heating value is what you get by burning it, extracting that same thermal energy and also extracting the energy of the water vapor. Because of course when you burn any hydrocarbon you get water and it comes out in the form of steam. So if you condense that steam you get extra heat out of the fuel. So that's why all the most efficient furnaces are going to be condensing. Now for the case of kerosene, um, the lower heating value is about you know, 93% of the higher heating value. So the fact that we're actually getting condensation out of this right now, just off my estimate here, I'd be guessing this is probably 90% efficient, somewhere in that ballpark, but of course we'll see when we do the calculations. All right, so running full tilt here. Still definitely getting some condensation coming out the back. Measure the very center of that exhaust stream. 138.5. All right, so you can see we're kind of still getting some steam flashing out of there. It's hard to tell because of the wind, but we're definitely getting something out. If I look in the end there, there's some soot, potentially residual soot from the previous run, but overall I'd say we're doing a lot better with that Alpine mode, uh, that air fuel ratio problem seems to have gone away and the exhaust coming out of here sure it might be 140 degrees in the very center but I can put my hand in front of here and it's not burning me so that tells me that we're extracting maybe not all but a lot of the energy it might not be as efficient as setting one but we're still doing quite good even at this high power level. So that concludes the testing. I've assembled a spreadsheet with all the figures on the screen. Uh, you can pause if you want a detailed look at the results. Uh, but to summarize, the base heat exchanger uh, gave us a 11.8% improvement over the uh, baseline heater, meaning that on a per unit fuel basis, we got 11.8% more heat. So 11.8% more bang for your buck. Now, with the addition of a turbulator on top of that to improve the heat exchanger efficiency by generating more turbulence, we actually only saw an improvement to the overall efficiency of 9.5%, which is actually a decrease from the heat exchanger without the turbulator. Now, this was because the heat exchanger clogged up with soot. Now, in that previous heat exchanger design without the turbulator, uh, we actually did still have soot generation from you know the air fuel ratio being too rich but those soot particles were able to simply drain out with the condensate whereas once we added in the turbulator uh, that was no longer able to occur now to address this what i did was i cleaned out the turbulator cleaned out the heat exchanger and we changed the heater over to alpine mode improving the air fuel ratio no more unburned fuel in the exhaust which by itself would improve efficiency. But on top of that, the heat exchanger obviously works a lot better when it's not clogged with soot. So the results of the final design were a 16% improvement in overall efficiency or a total overall efficiency of 101.5%. Now, obviously 101.5% efficiency, that's not possible. The reality is there's some error in the measurements as an example, if I measure the temperature at the center of the outlet, it's higher than the temperature at the edge of the outlet. Therefore, the actual outlet temperature of the heater is somewhat less than, than the values I actually recorded. Uh, so I can't be confident in that 101.5% overall efficiency figure, but I can be confident in the results comparing each run to the next. So I can confidently say that we did have a 16% improvement in overall efficiency. Now, in terms of actual efficiency values, the likely answer is that we were probably operating in the 
you know, low 80s, say 80% efficiency with the baseline heater. And then we went up to the low to mid 90s, say 93% with our final, you know, turbulator heat exchanger design. Now that might not sound like a ton, but over time it really can add up. And my primary goal, which wasn't actually improving the efficiency, but rather decreasing the exhaust temperatures, has been achieved. So now I can use a more portable sort of lower temperature rated tubing that's made out of flexible plastic and not rigid stainless steel. Um, so overall, I would consider this to be quite a successful project. Um, now, if you enjoy the video, please like and subscribe. Um, otherwise, thanks for watching and I will see you next time. Thank you.